<sighs> that was difficult to do with a straight face. Actually, I'm not even, I'm not sure that I did. All right. How's my hair look? Is that all right? All right, good. Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for a video I promised about two months ago now. Normally I don't like to leave you guys hanging, but with the arrival of Ryzen 7 followed by the GTX 1080 Ti, then Ryzen 5, Ryzen 5, and well, more Ryzen 5, that brings us to today. Anyway, back in February, I revisited the GeForce GTX 970 to see how Nvidia's hugely popular Maxwell-based GPU was getting on in modern titles. The 970 has been heavily criticised for the whole 3.5 gigabyte memory debacle, uh, and many claimed it would fall in a heap before too long, making it a bad buy, especially for second-hand shoppers. What I found, though, was quite the opposite. The 970 proved very capable at 1080p and even the 1440p resolution. Out of the box it was on par with the RX 470, though once overclocked we did see a performance boost of 12% on average, which allowed it to match the RX 484GB while falling only slightly short of the GTX 1060 6GB. In the end I recommended secondhand shoppers try and find a GTX 970 for around $150 US or say $250 Aussie. Of course, if you can snag one for less, that's even better. Following that video, the plan was to revisit the R9 390 to see how AMD's counterpart gets on in today's games and how it compares to the GTX 970. So that's exactly what we're doing. Lined up, I have 22 games on the menu, most of which are very recently released titles and all have been tested at 1080p and 1440p. For comparison, we have not just the GTX 970, but also the GTX 1070, 1060, 1050 Ti, RX 480, and RX 470. So we should be able to work out exactly where the R9 390 slots in today's landscape. For testing, I've taken my old HIS Radeon R9 390 Ice Q 2X OC graphics card. Benchmarked it in its out-of-the-box configuration, and then again with a custom overclock. Out-of-the-box, the card features a core clock speed of 1020 MHz, which is an insignificant 2% boost over the AMD reference clock speeds. I was able to manually raise the clock frequency to 1120 MHz, which was a further 10% overclock. Finally, by default, the GDDR5 memory comes clocked at 1500 MHz, and for our custom overclock, I pushed it up to 1700 MHz for a throughput of 6.8 gigabits per second. Finally, all testing was conducted using our Core i7 7700K test system, overclocked to 4.9 GHz with 32 GB of DDR4 3000 memory. First up we have Rise of the Tomb Raider, and here the R9 390 is able to match the RX 470, and while an 82 FPS average is certainly very playable, that did make it quite a bit slower than the GTX 970. Overclocked, it gained an additional 5 frames, and this placed it on par with the RX 480. Still, even overclocked, the R9 390 couldn't catch the GTX 970 in this title. Moving to 1440p, we find similar margins, though the R9 390 does close in a little bit on the GTX 970. Of course, Rise of the Tomb Raider is an NVIDIA-sponsored title and therefore tends to favour the green team a little bit more. Still, it's a visually impressive game that's well worth including, and with over 21 other games to look at, it's not going to skew the results by a meaningful margin. Interestingly, the R9 390 performs like a champ in Far Cry Primal, leaving the RX 480 behind and comfortably beating the GTX 970. That said, even factoring overclocking in, the R9 390 has just enough headroom to stay ahead of the overclocked GTX 970. Moving to 1440p, the R9 390 remains very strong, pushing 48 FPS, while the overclocked GTX 970 does fall away, managing just 43 FPS. It would seem that the larger memory buffer of the R9 390 is playing to its advantage here. That said though, both cards did play much better at 1080p. The Division is a very visually pleasing game using the ultra quality preset, but even so, the R9 390 makes out very well and once overclocked averaged 58 FPS at 1080p. This made it slightly faster than the GTX 970 for good measure. Now at 1440p, gamers will want to reduce the quality settings slightly as 43 FPS on average with dips below 30 FPS isn't ideal. The same will also be true for GTX 970 owners. As you would expect, the R9 390 performs very well in Hitman, and once overclocked it came second only to the GTX 1070. As this is an AMD sponsored title, it wasn't surprising to see the R9 390 crushing the GTX 970 here. 
We find much the same story at 1440p. Here the 390 managed to average 60 FPS while the overclocked GTX 970 struggled to average 50 FPS. Quantum Break isn't a game AMD fans like to see included, but it's not that old yet, so expect to see it hanging around till later this year. Anyway, the R9 390 averaged over 60 FPS with the game maxed out at 1080p, so there isn't much to worry about here. Not only that, but it managed to stay ahead of the GTX 970. Overclocked, the GTX 970 does catch up at 1440p, though it wasn't able to match the R9 390 once it was overclocked. Similar to games such as Hitman and The Division, you will want to sacrifice visual quality ever so slightly at this resolution for smoother frame rates. Unsurprisingly, the R9 390 handles Overwatch at 1080p with ease, delivering a silky smooth 155 FPS on average and 165 FPS once overclocked. It might have been a bit slow on the GTX 970 in this title, but with well over 100 FPS at all times, it hardly matters. Moving to 1440p, we do see frame rates drop, as you would expect, and now the GTX 970 isn't that much faster than the 390. In fact, the minimum frame rates are very similar indeed. Like Overwatch, we find high frame rates in Doom as well, though this time the R9 390 is ahead. Quite a bit once overclocking's factored in. Moving to 1440p again reduces the frame rate quite a bit, and now the R9 390 and GTX 970's performance is fairly similar, though the Radeon GPU is of course still faster. As you can see, the R9 390 handles Total War Warhammer with relative ease, maintaining over 60 FPS at all times in its out-of-the-box form. Meanwhile, overclocking helped just squeeze a few more frames out of the card. Once again, though, in terms of performance, it was very similar to the GTX 970 at 1080p. Moving to 1440p gives the R9 390 the edge over the GTX 970, though I should emphasize that it's only a very slight edge. With nothing more than the factory overclocking in play, we see that the HIS 390 and Gamewood GTX 970 are neck and neck in Mirror's Edge Catalyst. Overclock the 970 does a little better, but the margins are hardly extreme. Jumping to 1440p helps out the R9 390 in its battle against the 970, though once again the margins are very minor. Race fans will enjoy slightly, ever so slightly better performance with the GTX 970 as the R9 390 trails by a few frames per second at 1080p and much the same is also found at 1440p. Still both graphics cards enabled smooth gameplay performance in this title using the maximum in quality game settings. The R9 390 did very well in Deus Ex Mankind Divided matching the 4GB 480 out of the box while it matched the 8GB version once overclocked. This made it a good bit faster than the GTX 970, even with the Maxwell part overclocked. Of course, Mankind Divided is an AMD sponsored title, so the findings here aren't totally surprising. Moving to 1440p, we find much the same, though none of the graphics cards tested were particularly impressive in terms of performance using the very high quality preset. Pushing over 60 FPS at all times in Battlefield 1 isn't particularly difficult with modern mid range hardware, which speaks to how well the game's optimized. Even with the ultra quality settings in play, the R9 390 sped out over 80 FPS on average at 1080p. Moving to 1440p, we still saw an average of over 60 FPS, and once overclocked, the R9 390 and GTX 970 delivered very similar performance. Mafia 3 is still inexplicably demanding using the high quality preset, though the game does tend to favour hardware from the green team. As a result, the GTX 970 was found to be slightly faster than the R9 390 at 1080p. Now at 1440p you can forget about the high quality settings, even on medium the game is extremely demanding. Anyway, here we see the 390 and 970 delivering the same performance. The HIS R9 390 was good for an average of 77 FPS at 1080p when playing Gears of War 4, making it a few frames faster than the game with GTX 970. Overclocked, the 970 does pull a few frames ahead, so the roles are reversed. Jumping to 1440p again plays in favour of the R9 390, and here we see both previous generation GPUs render 52 FPS on average, which is quite impressive given we are using the ultra quality preset. Titanfall 2 fans will enjoy the fact that the previous generation graphics cards are still able to deliver exceptional performance in this title. The 390 was also faster than the 970 in both the out of the box form as well as with the custom overclock. The margins did close up at 1440p, though it was interesting to note that the R9 390 offered exceptional minimum frame rate performance, beating the 970 by 6 FPS out of the box. Granted, high frame rates aren't necessary to enjoy Civilization VI, but it's nice to see the R9 390 providing strong results all the same. Averaging over 60 FPS at 1080p will ensure smooth animation in this title.
as the game is primarily CPU bound, we find only a slight dip in frame rate performance when jumping from 1080p to 1440p. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is another modern title that's not particularly demanding, though you could argue that it's down to the somewhat dated looking graphics. Anyway, the 390 was good for at least 73 FPS on average, allowing it to match the GTX 1063GB, while overclocking put it within striking distance of the 6GB model. Moving to 1440p, the 390 can be seen leading the GTX 970, and the margin is reasonably large when comparing the out-of-the-box performance. Watch Dogs 2 provides similar results between the factory overclocked GTX 970 and R9 390, both averaging around 55 FPS at 1080p. This meant custom overclocking gave the GTX 970 the edge, but the margins were far from extreme. Now at 1440p, the overclocked GTX 970 pulls further ahead, hitting 47 FPS to the R9 390's 41 FPS. Ideally, gamers will want to lower the quality settings here to achieve frame rates closer to 60 FPS. For those of you unaware, using very high quality settings makes Resident Evil 7 a massive VRAM pig, and as a result, even at 1080p, the R9 390 is able to pull ahead of the GTX 970 well ahead. Out of the box, the 390 was almost 40% faster than the 970, that's a devastating margin right there. Increasing the resolution only makes life harder for the GTX 970, as the R9 390 is now 47% faster. Whereas the R9 390 is good for at least 66 FPS, the 970 can only muster 45 FPS. For those of you who like to cross swords, we have For Honor, and here we find another ding-dong battle between the R9 390 and GTX 970. Out of the box, the R9 390 was a smidgen quicker, while the 970 pulled a fraction ahead once overclocked. We find much the same story at 1440p between the 390 and 970. Still, the 390 looked good overclocked, matching the RX 480 8GB. We're getting there people, second last game, and it's Prey. Here the 390 churned out an impressive 95 FPS on average, which placed it on par with the GTX 970. Moving to 1440p, the 390 again matched the 970 out of the box, though overclocking did hand the 970 a rather massive win over the 390. Still both were good for over 50 FPS at all times, using the very high quality settings. Alright, we made it. Dawn of War 3, the last game tested. Right, so at 1080p, the 390 was good for 73 FPS on average, which is essentially what we saw from the 970. Once again, overclocking helped the 970 snag the lead as it hit 85 FPS to the 76 FPS of the overclocked 390. On the other hand, the 1440p resolution once again helps out the R9 390, allowing it to close in on the overclocked 970. In the end, an average of around 50 FPS is plenty for smooth playable performance in Dawn of War 3. The power consumption for the R9 390 isn't as bad as I recall. Total system consumption only increased by 13% over the GTX 970, so really that's not a big issue at all. Not only that, but with a high-end overclocked Core i7 7700K CPU, the entire system consumed well under 400 watts when gaming. Overclocking the R9 390 did push consumption up to 351 watts for the entire system, but even then that's still very manageable. Of course, when compared to current generation GPUs such as the GTX 1060 or the RX 480, the R9 390 does look like a bit of a power pig. Alright, all 22 games are now in the bag. It felt like for the most part the R9 390 and GTX 970 were pretty well neck and neck, often trading blows depending on the title. But which one came out on top overall, and by how much? Well, let's go take a look, shall we? Well, out of the box, the R9 390 was 7% faster than the GTX 970, producing on average 80 FPS at 1080p, and the margin grew to 8% at 1440p. Overclocked the 390 enjoyed a performance boost of just 5% on average, and this was seen at both tested resolutions. Meanwhile, the GTX 970 did much better through overclocking, enjoying on average a 12% boost in performance. Surprisingly, however, even with this massive boost, the GTX 970 was still only able to match the 390 with both GPUs overclocked. What's really interesting to note is that almost two years ago, back when Matt was presenting on the channel in this beautiful blue top, we put together a 22 game battle between the R9 390 and GTX 970, and not a single game featured back then was featured in today's video. Back then we found both graphics cards delivered identical performance across the 22 games tested at 1440p. In that comparison we picked the GTX 970 over the R9 390 for the simple fact that it consumed less power and overclocked considerably better. As you might imagine we did cop quite a bit of flack for picking the GTX 970, 
mostly because of that whole, like I said, 3.5 gigabyte memory debacle. And at the time, most reviewers were going with the safer option, which was the R9 390. Quite a number of viewers claimed that within a year the GTX 970 would fall in a heap as newer, more demanding titles were released, allowing the 390 to take charge and therefore making it a wiser investment. Well, here we are, well over a year later, with 22 new and much more demanding games, and as you've just seen, it's still neck and neck. The R9 390 has made up some ground, though that's not entirely surprising as AMD has made significant strides in their driver development otherwise known as fine wine technology. It's a funny spin, that. Anyway, overclocked, both graphics cards now deliver similar performance overall, while the GTX 970 still remains a little more power efficient. So, picking between the two is just as hard in 2017 as it was back in 2015. Thankfully, you don't really need to worry about which one to get as much these days. I would simply go with the best secondhand deal you can find. With out-of-the-box performance similar to that of the RX 470 or GTX 1060, which costs around $170 US or $240 Australian, you won't want to spend that much on a second-hand GTX 970 or R9 390. Given that they are second-hand, and that means that there isn't going to be any kind of warranty, couple that with the fact that they do consume more power, I would aim for a maximum purchase price of $150 US or around $200 Aussie. It might be hard to find these graphics cards for those prices though, as they have held their value very well, and that's probably because of the performance just seen. That said though, I recommend you look to spend about $120 US or $180 Aussie. At those prices, you will be getting a really good deal. Well, that's going to do it for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed the comparison, and I'm keen to see how these two GPUs compare in another year or so. For pricing, please check the links in the video description. And if you do want to support the channel directly and gain access to a monthly live stream with Brian from Tech City and myself, then consider pledging $1 per month on Patreon. Anyway, that's all the begging I'm going to do on this one. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon, guys.